Well, I'm very excited to be here, and you'll hear my heavy breathing in between uh, the words that I speak to you. I'm deeply honored to be part of the, uh, the exhibits that are occurring in this museum, um, and I'm very excited to tell you about some of the developments that have happened to this idea that started 11 years ago in a classroom. So imagine yourself back in your own schools when you were undergraduates or graduate students and you've heard about something in class and you go home and you think about it. The next thing you know, <clears throat> it's happening. And I think that's what's happened in this case. So I'm so, so pleased to be able to share this with you. So how does our food production system uh, fail and, and why do we need to find something else to do? So if we can get this to work. I am busy pointing this in the right direction, but apparently it's not working. Ah, here we go. So let's start with some basics. This is my mantra. This is what I believe, and this is what I believe everybody else believes, that everybody is entitled to at least safe food and safe water. If you're born, this is what you get. That's actually part of your birth certificate. But of course, that's not the case throughout a lot of part of the world. And it relates very much to our technological advances, creating problems in these places. And if I can tell me, here we go. Here are some of the challenges. Of course, safe water, safe food, and security. But we have to repair the environment also. We've damaged a lot of it, making room for our food production. And of course, everybody talks about reducing our fossil fuel use also which I don't think anybody disagrees with, but it's hard to find alternatives to it. About three million years ago, uh, a hominid very similar to us arose out of the plains of East Africa. And about 200,000 years ago, we emerged from that evolutionary process. And 10,000 years ago to the present, we created a new world for ourselves. You're standing in it. You see around you all of the manifestations of technology. That's what this museum is devoted to. But in the biosphere that we came from, we came from cycles in which there were no beginnings and no ends. Biogeochemical cycles, ecological cycles. Through these 10,000 years of our evolutionary history to the present, though, we've created a technological morass. For instance, I shouldn't be able to see where you live, but if I turn out the lights, I can see where you live. We've chosen to live in cities. This requires lots of energy. So we have unintended consequences of technology, unpredicted. That is, we become the only species on this planet that doesn't know what to do with their own waste. In ecology, there's a usefulness for everything that occurs. But in the world we've created, we're busy choking ourselves to death. And that death is being caused by the waste that we accumulate. Here's a good example. I know we're familiar with this, but look at this picture of this poor guy in a canoe trying to paddle his way through all of these bottles floating off in the North Pacific gyre just off the coast of California in a size of ocean twice the size of Texas. We did that. We don't know how to correct it. So let's go back 15,000 years ago. There wasn't a single farm on this planet. There might have been a million of us. And today, <coughs> look what we find ourselves in. 6.8 billion people. And our ecological footprint for food production is bigger than the size of South America. You might think you're listening to Malthus talking up here. That's not true. Not at all. There are technological solutions for this, but we have to realize what the problems are first. We've spent a lot of time deforesting, making room for, far, uh, for our farms, and this has created our biggest issue, climate change. How do we absorb all that carbon that we keep putting into the atmosphere if we have no more trees? So we have these things to deal with. And in the same time, we've created cities that uses resources like crazy and creates these black box problems of resources in, wastes out, and the rest is what you see. Now, I'm not against that, of course, because I live in a city, and I love living in a city, and I think we all do, that live there. But this creates problems, as Atlanta, Georgia shows us from outer space. You can actually watch the growth of this. And in fact, I'll bet you, you could actually determine the year that Ted Turner moved there <laughs> by seeing the way Atlanta was before he moved and Atlanta afterwards. So we've got some problems to solve. And agriculture, 
in all of its forms, has been wonderful in the sense that it has brought us to the present. But it has created problems along the way of its own. Herbicides, the use of fossil fuels, fertilizers, pesticides, and it uses 70% of the available fresh water on the planet. If you take like Bacall and move it over here, sure we get our food, but we also get agricultural runoff, the biggest source of pollution on the planet. So cities that depend on this food are, in current states of configuration, unsustainable. If we're going to make it into the next millennium, we need solutions. I don't think we need to continue to blame each other for the problems. We need to all band together. There are 6.8 billion genomes out there. Let's put them to use. Let's get them to think about this. All we have to do is look back to nature, because, as we all know, nature has all the answers, every single answer. However, <coughs> it requires asking the right questions. So every time you ask a question, and you look to nature for the answer, there it is. And it could be some weird answers. I once heard a TED talk about how geckos climb glass walls. <laughs> the guy invented gloves to imitate how this works, and they have little nanofibers on their hands, and their hands don't close like ours. They close this way so they can get them off to make room for the next climb. Then he just climbed a wall with the gloves. <laughs> it was quite amazing, actually. Quite amazing. So biomimicry has taken us a long way in many ways. The one I want you to look at is the ecosystem. So what is it? It's a series of interlocking life forms, mutually dependent on all the other life forms. Ecosystems are easy to describe from a standpoint of biodiversity. They're balanced when we don't disturb them, and they're resilient. If nature disturbs them through storms or through droughts or floods, insect invasions, etc., population increases, these ecosystems that are untouched by human hands mostly can recover. <laughs> and above all, they're sustainable, and there's a good reason for that. Nature takes what the universe gives it in the form of energy, in this case from the sun, and distributes it throughout the life forms. In an equal fashion, so that everybody gets a little bit of it. The terrestrial and the aquatic ecosystems, everybody gets their fair share. Cities don't behave that way; they want to keep growing. And I don't know why that ethic exists, but all of them seem to imitate that that anti-nature、uh, behavior. So, if we are all in agreement that nature has all the answers, then of course. <laughs> What should our question be? I'll tell you what mine is. My question is: Can we provide a sustainable, safe, and abundant food and water supply for 10 billion people? Because we will have 10 billion in another 20 to 30 years from now. And the answer, if I just left it there, would be: Of course we could, but we'd have to use the size of Brazil to farm. Of course, Brazil would have something to say about that. But we need to do one more thing. We need to bring the, the Earth back into balance. Otherwise, we will die ourselves. We'll shoot ourselves in the foot. So I think we can do this. Matter of fact, on second thought, we have to do this. We don't have a choice. But how? So we will create an eco city. That's all. Simple. Class dismissed. Any questions? Sure. Come on, let's go outside and create that ecosystem. But、hmm, where do we start? Well, if I begin by telling you what an ecosystem is, it begins with bioproductivity, food for all the plants and animals. Okay, if an ecosystem is going to behave this way, it has to make its own food. Well, part of the exhibits here demonstrates how to do this in a tall building. We can actually grow food hydroponically, and aeroponically, and with drip irrigation. Indoors, and save a lot of land outside. We have these tools; they're available for us. A lot of you are familiar with them already.、It、sounds like、mm, you know factory food or artificial food, or well, we're going to hear about artificial food actually. <laughs> Good artificial food. Half of what you eat 
comes from these kinds of operations now, especially during the wintertime when farms are not productive, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. But look what we're doing now. With technological breakthroughs, we can create, using these technologies, the sustainable eco-city, which recycles both the water part and the solid part from our wastes. And once we decide to do that, we'll handle all the other waste problems too, because we can handle them similarly. If we could, I'll take that back, when we create urban agriculture, in which vertical farming plays a role, a large role, we will have no more agricultural runoff, because we'll recycle the water. It's a closed-loop agricultural system. We get year-round production of crops. What's wrong with that? We get no crops lost because of severe weather events. We use 70% less water than normal agriculture, and again, with no runoff. And above all, we get to repair the environment, because for every indoor acre, well, I'll show you that. For every indoor acre of land, um, and that's the next slide coming up after all these. <clears throat> we can remediate gray water. We'll just have other uses right now. We create new jobs. This is not trivial, by the way. We supply fresh produce for inner city dwellers because we can use abandoned city properties for this. Finally, we can even grow biofuels and plant-derived drugs. You don't have to grow food necessarily. So here's this ratio I was just referring to. For every indoor acre of farm that you create, you can actually save 10 to 20 outdoor acres of land that you could then allow to go back to the way it was before we farmed it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Creating an ecotourism uh, situation in most of, those situ most of those cases. Here's a few forced examples of what happens to the Earth after we leave it alone. The demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, Chernobyl, and a, a long-term study at Harvard Brook shows that the Earth will repair itself if we can just keep our little hands off it. So, you skeptics out there, I don't blame you. Say, sure, you're just talking like an academic. Well, perhaps, but we're already doing a lot of this. Let's take food, energy, and water just as examples here. Food, sure, we can produce lots of it indoors, and here's some good examples. Here's a 318-acre, one-story greenhouse operation in the middle of the Arizona desert. And look at the shopping list from hydroponically produced plants. And these are commercial available plants. There's a tremendous uh, advance that has been made over the last 10 years in this area. How about energy? Sure, let's take our solid wastes and incinerate them in a safe fashion. In fact, this method pyrolyzes it, and there's nothing to show at the end except energy and the elements. Japan is employing this now on a large scale. It works, it's safe, and I think it's just a matter of social marketing to get it acceptable in lots of other places. And finally, water. The city of Santa Ana, California, went to the governor and said, we need more water, and he said, well, go make it yourself. <clears throat> As Ar only Arnold could say, go make it yourself. So they did. They went back, hired engineers, and built a $500 million water processing plant that takes black water, which is urine and feces, separates the water, separates the solids, takes the water and reprocesses it and makes it into drinking water. But of course, they wouldn't drink it, so they had to percolate it over the ground and draw it out of the ground and say, no, no your water doesn't come from there, it comes from over here, but it really comes from over there. <laughs> So how about designs? What would a vertical farm look like? We can go in the next room and see something like that, but eight years ago, there was only one of these designs. Here it is. That's eight years ago. I'll show you what the power of the internet is. And today, if we go to Google, we can find 6.7 million website hits for that term. And on the images alone, we can find 1.7 million website hits. And all of these images that you see here were not solicited by me. These were people who picked this idea up and they ran with it. And here are some of their beautiful drawings. I'm just going to scroll through this because I want you to get an impression here of people catching this bug in their head, going home, and they couldn't sleep. They were agitated. 
I know what one looks like. I know what one looks like. I can do AutoCAD. I know I can do it. And so they did it, and they stayed up night after night after night. They went to work, and they went home and worked on this. And then they sent them to me, and I put them up on my net site, which is verticalfarm.org. And you can go look at them, too. Here's one for Chicago. There's a lot of them out there, and more that I don't know about coming up. Look at all these drawings. Look at the incredible detail of this. Look at, they've thought of everything. What to do with the black water, how to recycle the water, how to monitor the nutrients, what kind of crops you're going to grow. It's amazing. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. Here's one for Australia. You know, that country catches on fire every year. It burns to the ground. Do you know what happened this year in Australia? They had the first good crop in 10 years. Guess who else knew that? Locust. And they came along and they ate it. Why? Because that's part of the natural cycle. Remember, farming is not a natural thing for humans to do. We invented this. We created it. It's only 10,000 years old. All these intricate, interesting, beautiful drawings. How real are these? How, how could we go about doing this? We can't start with a building like this. That's ridiculous. Well, I think I know how to start. You can start by making prototypes. Well, I'm just going to show you this one here, but you're already here. Probably should have left this slide out. You can just go next door and see that. So create the prototype with who? How about raise your hands if you have kids? Come on, don't be shy. Check out this prototype. This is the kind of prototype that I love. Why? Because when these third graders grow up, they're going to expect them. You bet. Here's one we presented to the city of Newark. They loved it. I wish Newark had the money to actually do it. Perhaps somebody sitting out there can help us out. It's a beautiful, beautiful iteration, a beautiful way of expressing our technology. We can create buildings that make our food. We can then look back the other way and say how beautiful the landscape now looks, now that we can leave it alone. We can get back our hardwood forests and our grains and our uh, tall grass prairies. So I want to thank all my students, many of them, 105 to be exact. They'd be thrilled to be here tonight to share this with you. Time for me to stop talking. Time for us to start doing. Farm smart. Save water. Save land. Save lives. Let the earth repair itself. Help keep that green planet and that blue planet together. You want to read more? There's a book coming out. Gee, I wonder who wrote that. I guess I did. <laughs> It'll be out next week. <laughs> Thank you.